Light pollution means that uh, the natural light conditions, that means the light of uh, stars, the moon and completely darkness are polluted by artificial light at night with negative impacts on man and nature. Year after year light pollution increases across the globe. It can even be seen from space. Artificial light at night represents security, wealth and modernity. But too much light endangers flora and fauna, impacts ecosystems, makes the stars disappear and may affect human health. But at this point we can only guess what the true implications are for humans and for the natural systems on which we depend. We need much more research to be able to understand and to be able to trade off between the different needs for uh, illumination during the night uh, that we have an understanding at what light levels, for instance, artificial light at night becomes light pollution. And based on this, we can develop such concepts and identify lighting, sustainable lighting technologies. Coordinated by the IGB, the Interdisciplinary Research Project, Verlust der Nacht, is addressing the environmental and cultural impacts of artificial light as well as the implications for human health. The project joins scientists from many different disciplines carrying out innovative research projects in urban and rural areas. So we've done a lot of flights over Berlin with our institutes Chesna. We used, um, for example, 3,000 photos that we took one night to make a mosaic of the whole city. So we flew at 10,000 feet, about 13 stripes across the city, and when we put it together in a mosaic, then we could understand where the light is coming from, what the sources were. By analyzing these sources, then we can understand where the city should prioritize its interventions, and we've learned uh, what things are important and not so important in order to reduce the amount of light going into the sky. What I hope is that by demonstrating areas that are uh, lit very well and areas that are lit poorly, meaning they produce a lot of waste light, that we'll be able to show cities around the world that they could light their cities effectively and better. And so that uh, we'll still have well-lit cities that don't produce as much light pollution. Time-lapse video uh, shows that uh, the light is uh, changing quite dramatically. We looked at the Alexanderplatz as one of the light hotspots. We wanted to know what we see by satellite, whether this is the picture of the night or whether the light intensity at this hotspot is changing over the course of the night. And another point which the students studied was that they made a survey with the inhabitants who are living here because we supposed that there were a lot of light conflicts due to the light intensity. The preliminary results of this survey show that there are not so many conflicts as we expected. two projects, sub-projects, that are looking at historical dimensions of light pollution uh, and lighting since about the 1880s, and then a second sub-project that's looking more at um, the sort of social dimensions of lighting and regulatory issues involved. So we were quite surprised and interested to see that in history there were lots of conflicts about light, for instance when strong electric lighting was introduced and started replacing gas lamps in Berlin. Well, there was protest by people who were protesting against the glare, 
strong light being given. So this notion of, of lighting being conflictual only today, and only today light pollution is an issue, is, is incorrect. There were many issues in the past. In terms of the history of Germany, history of Berlin, obviously you can't ignore the Nazi regime and what the Nazis, how they used light uh, as an instrument of power. So here we see the kind of ambivalence of artificial lighting being used as a, as a tool for progress on the one hand, but as an instrument for power and repression on the other. In our quantitative survey, we asked the uh, inhabitants of Schulzendorf how they perceive lighting, how they perceive the functions of artificial lighting, what they consider to be important, but as well how they perceive darkness. We were quite happy with the, with the results and, and learned that artificial lighting is something people are concerned about. I think uh, the idea of reducing light pollution can't be uh, to shut down our lighting but to think where do we want to have lighting and what times do we want to have lighting and be very specific about the different spatial contexts and the different societal needs. And then we may have a good lighting that is environmentally friendly and is helpful or good and serves all societal functions that we want light to have. Light is a very, very important part of our life. Uh, humans have evolved to live in the light, but we also need the darkness for rest. We need the change, the regular change between light and darkness for our internal clock, which is a very basic function of our body. And it has tremendous influences on our body if this clock doesn't work properly. And this inner clock is controlled by light. So we want to know how street light actually influences our inner clock, our biological rhythms. Okay, What we did in the integration project Kommune uh, in Schulzendorf was we were checking how people react on the change in street lights and also on the physiological, that is hormonal level. So we're measuring melatonin. Melatonin is the hormone that controls the internal clock. And usually it's produced during darkness, but we wanted to know whether street light changes the production and the concentration of melatonin. The task of the Department of Lighting Technology and the research project Loss of Night is the evaluation of lighting installations and developing recommendations for good lighting. For this we use a photogoniometer, we call it, and with uh, this we can analyze every direction uh, a luminaire is giving light to. Our uh, research is to define the measurement conditions and the uh, illumination of the field. This gives us the possibility to create and to find technical solutions and uh, to measure the luminance distribution, for instance, for the technical description of the different uh, faculties. Yeah, you can compare a street light with a vacuum cleaner. Like a vacuum cleaner, streets are attracting insects from habitats nearby and uh, where they can't be used by fish or by, by birds as a food source. So we have the problem that uh, whole food webs can be distracted by artificial light at night. Because on the other side there are some profiters like spiders, some bad species that take advantage of this new situation. They can use the high density of disorientated insects like a buffet. And so these distracted ecosystems or food webs will have consequences in the future. In this street you see how the illumination technology has been changed, something what we have to expect in Europe everywhere in a few years. So the, here the street lamps use now LEDs as a, a light source and before it was mercury vapor. So we investigate how this impacts the diversity of insects around these lamps. Okay. Good. Also man sieht sehr schön 
Das typische Artenspektrum. Bats are nocturnal, so you can assume that bats react to artificial light. But nobody knows in which way they do so. So there are some species that are known to forage at the streetlights, so they are not heavily disturbed by the lights. But other species totally disappear when artificial light is put somewhere. So we try to investigate how the general picture looks like. Which species do react in which way to artificial light and how different kinds of light um, affect the bat community differently. And in particular I'm interested here in how different kinds of street lights differ in their influence on bat activity. The topic is so exciting because light pollution occurs everywhere in the world. The street lights will be transformed to LED lights in many countries, but nobody knows how the bats will react to this change. So that's why I'm interested in so much into this change from one kind of light to the other. I'm looking for the influence of light pollution on perch, uh, European perch and uh, the roach especially on, um, on the influence on the um, hormonal system, um, melatonin as rhythm hormone and uh, cortisol as a stress marker. The lowest level I was using was 1 lux, which is very low, and even at 1 lux um, the melatonin rhythm was um, completely um, disturbed. No melatonin rhythm also means that the whole rhythm is disturbed, so also the other rhythms may be uh, influenced by that. Another student from our project, she found values of about one lux um, in a, of course, very bright area in, um, in Berlin, in half a meter water depth. She found one lux, especially in urban areas, light pollution could really have an influence on fish species. This basic research is always, um, is always cool because you're doing things that no one has ever done before. Actually, you are a pioneer and yeah, this is quite cool. We have three types of traps, one type in the air on the um, lights, one type um, on the ground and one type on the water. There are lots of uh, insects in these traps so we can say how they change their behavior when light is here, artificial light. In the study sites of the West Harbour land we work with common starlings, European starlings. Every of these street lamps has a mounted nest box, like this on the tree. We have hoped that the European starlings will accept this, what means that they start to breed in the spring in these nest boxes, and we can make investigations about the influence of the artificial night light on the starlings breeding in this nest boxes. We have a sample from the field and I sort out the different groups of animals and these are uh, butterflies, nocturnal butterflies. Afterwards uh, we can uh, determine which species um, they are and we can say one species uh, maybe flies more to the light than another. The idea behind the app is that it allows regular people to let us know how bright the sky is. And you can see there's a little arrow that shows me which way I should turn the phone and my body in order to get in the direction 
that uh, I need to be. And then it tells me to look up into the sky until I find the brightest star in the sky. And then I can say whether or not I'm able to see that star. The main goal is to be able to understand how the brightness of the sky is changing worldwide. And this is something that you can really only do with citizen science because you need to have people all over in different places in the world in order to do it. I knew about light pollution already since I was a small child because we used to go stargazing in my hometown and uh, the northern area was blocked off because of light pollution. But now if I go back to my hometown, uh, I can't see the Milky Way even, uh, even outside of the town usually. And it's because the lighting has changed so much in these years. So what I'd like to have is that hopefully through my work at some point in the future, um, my kids and their kids will be able to see stars again, even from within the city. This conference is very interdisciplinary, so we have uh, people here that uh, speak about dark skies, about astronomy. There are also people uh, talking about uh, the health of men and also uh, the influence of artificial light in nature and also uh, how artificial light is accepted. Light pollution is affecting many things. Uh, the first is astronomy, the stars. We do not know really what kind of influence in nature. We know the insects, we know the birds, but uh, we are also just beginning to understand uh, the influence of too much artificial light on human beings. There is an urgent need for interdisciplinary research. We have to understand who is responsible for illumination, who are the actors in this game, more or less, and, and what are the impacts on man, on nature, on our social life. We need much more research to be able to understand and to be able to trade off between the different needs for uh, illumination during the night, uh, that we have an understanding at what light levels, for instance, artificial light at night becomes light pollution and to understand for different spatial temporal contexts. For instance, in a green area in the middle of the city, we have to protect light sensitive animals. In other areas, a living area, a peri-urban area, we have to protect the sleep of humans. The requirements to such kind of illumination is completely different. So for an intelligent uh, modern illumination concept, we need this knowledge. Based on this, we can identify sustainable lighting technologies.